everybody. So we have the pleasure to be with Mike from Devil Driver. And Mike, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you for being part of, of the episode two of the what we call the Mads Guitar video cast here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about um, an album I just listened to, you know, and I'm, I'm still, you know, under the, the vibe of it called Deal with, Dealing with Demons. So we're going to talk about like the significations about the strong lyrics and the strong, you know, music of the, the full uh, the full album, and then to talk about, you know, the, the guitar geek thing, because that's why, uh, you know, we, we're doing this. Uh, so um, I, I just, as I said, listen to the, the full thing, and um, there is particularly some, some stuff I just noticed, which are, you know, the lyrics, which are super strong. So does that, does the title mean something like you guys were dealing with some demons from your past or is that because the world is dealing actually from a lot of demons from you know the the humanity past does, does that have does this title have a relation with with that that's more of a question for des because believe it or not you know i'm never really around for the vocal process okay. and you know it's Devil Driver has always been the type of band where we do the music first. We, you know, in this case, it was me, Austin, and Neil. And, um, you know, Des would come by when we were doing pre-production and when we're in the studio. But even when we're writing music, we don't give him, like, well, I'll give him, like, two or three songs at a time to listen to. But he, it's, he doesn't really like to start writing until he gets a bulk of the material. Okay. So you can kind of feel how the whole album's going to sound, what kind of vibe we're going for, and then he'll start writing after that. But, I mean, there was even a, a six-month gap after finishing the music and him recording vocals for Dealing With Demons. Oh, okay. You know, we finished the music, we had to go do some touring, we came home, and then I think uh, it was like shortly after the holidays of 2018. So I want to say, in, I think... I think he was doing it in like January or February of 2019 and six months before that we had finished the music so I had no idea what Des was going to be doing okay you know, we didn't we never got together and I mean like you know me Austin and Neil got together and played the songs with our you know in a studio with our producer Steve Evans for two weeks before we did the record but um that's just the, the way we've always done things you know it's it's the music, then the vocals. It's never done all at once. So, so when you guys, it's very interesting because then you, you mean you, you, then you're doing the music and it's inspiring uh, or not, but mostly inspiring, I guess. Uh, the you know the, the the lyrics that comes after. So finally, where where did you have that you know the, the idea of the new riff that are uh, you know on on the on the new album because there is a particularly particularly one I loved. Which, which is called Nest of Viper, Nest mm -hmm. of Vipers, which is like super heavy. And I, I just also noticed that the two guitars are really doing like such an amazing uh, duo and it's very complimentary. So are you more into, uh, it, are you guys sharing the riffs idea or it's, it's coming maybe more from you or it just, uh, you guys meet each other in the studio or you-, you It's come pretty, it's pretty 50-50, okay. you know, yeah. Um, Neil wrote a, a lot of material. He and I wrote about the same amount of material and also our drummer Austin plays guitar too. So he's got a couple songs and riffs, you know, throughout the records. But um, on most of this album, I mean, that's, you know, as far as the writing goes, it's, it's, it's pretty evenly spaced between me and Neil writing the riffs and then Austin writing a few on his own. But um, one thing that we did differently on this record that we've never done before is, you know, our producer Steve wanted Neil playing the rhythms on the right and me playing the Neils on the left or vice versa. I forget which side we're on, but um, we've never done that before. It's like if whoever wrote the riff would usually play the rhythms on both sides. Okay. Of, and we even, you know, we did different guitars, we did different overdrive pedals, we did different amps, speaker cabinets, microphone configurations. So it's one side of every song, as far as the rhythms go, is Neil playing through a very unique uh, signal chain. Mm -hmm. And then me on the other side, 
doing my own signal chain, different guitars, different pickups, everything. So um, you're hearing both of us on every song, which is not something that we usually do. And Steve wanted to do it this way because when Neil plays, he gets a lot more low end out of his guitar compared to me. And I get a lot more high end. Okay. He's got a lighter, lighter touch on his right hand. I got a little bit of a heavier feel. And Steve really thought that meshing those two together would uh, complement you know, yeah. the tone really that's, well. That's but, a total success. You know, I was, I was hearing that, uh, you know, on, on, on uh, dealing with demons. And I mean, I was amazed as well by the, the soloing stuff. Uh, which which made me you know thinking what well, are the fight you know the, the influences of those two guitar players you know so on, on your end is that mostly like I, I saw you were like a big fan and you started guitar because hearing uh, Def Leppard I think initially um, or on, on MTV or, or stuff like that so but what are your your influences uh, to you know to compose and write music finally. It started off when I was really little, it started off with Oingo Boingo, okay. you know, Dan, Danny Elfman's uh, band in, in the 80s. Um, I'm not sure, they did, they had a little bit of a following out in Europe, I'm sure, but okay. I, th I think their biggest following was out here in California where they were from. Um, then after that, I discovered Metal, or no, it was Def Leppard, yeah. And then Metallica, and when I was really into Metallica, you know, it was also really into Pantera and Megadeth, yeah. and uh, Carcass as well was another band that I was really into. And around high school, I started getting really into the whole industrial goth thing. Okay. Good. And you know, Marilyn Manson came, FDM, Skinny Puppy. Uh, a lot of you know ministry nine inch nails all that stuff that's still kind of where my heart really lies with music i industrial good industrial bands are hard to find but it's definitely still my favorite genre of music and uh you know i got into like rammstein and um other things like that and then when i got to santa barbara where I met all the guys in Devil Driver, they were the, some of those guys were the ones that started um, introducing me to more of like the Scandinavian metal scene, you know, At the Gates, In Flames, Dark Tranquility, um, Jimmy Borgir, Opeth, you know, all those bands. And that played a really big role in my writing when they got me into that, because I was really into the whole very melodic yeah. European style of metal. And no one had exposed it to me to it before. You know, I was like, I just, it was a whole genre of metal that I just didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. And I got really, really into it. And I, I almost say I got a little too into it where a lot of my, the music that I wrote back in the day, even when I go back and listen to songs that I wrote for Devil Driver that never made records and stuff like that. It's just like, you, you, can just, you listen to it and you go, man, this guy was listening to a lot of Scandi Scandinavian metal at the time, wasn't he? But but things have changed a little bit with the way I write. I don't really write like that anymore. And, um, you know, influences when you get older get kind of tough. I think you kind of, for me personally, I don't let outside people influence my music as much as they did before. I think I've kind of figured out how to do things a little bit more in a little bit more unique way for myself mm -hmm. recently. Yeah, to get your signature thing, maybe your signature writing or tone. Uh, one yeah, and I'm just embracing new things. You know, I used to, me and my old drummer, John Berklin, we used to kind of bicker a lot. He, he would write a lot of these like thrashy, dissonant, you know, ugly sounding riffs that never really resonated well with me. And then for some reason, after he quit the band, I started embracing that whole writing style a lot more. <laughs> and... You know, we're still really close and we'll, we'll joke around about it. And, you know, and you know, we'll talk. It's like, why the fuck didn't you write song, you know, wrist <laughs> like this when I was in the band? And you were so against it. I'm like, sorry. I don't you know. know. It came later, you know. <laughs> Better late than never. But yeah, I feel like if he and I were writing together now, we probably would have gotten gotten along a little bit better. As far, and uh, he, I think he would like what I was writing writing now more than what I was writing 10 years ago. Well, I, I'm sure I'm sure he's going to enjoy like the, he's enjoying the the record and uh, I mean it was such a such a surprise and you're talking about the melodic thing you know but 
when I was reading about, about you guys, uh, a lot of people out there calls you like, um, like a metal groove band, but uh, I, it's truly, you, you get truly some groove in your, in your riff, you know? So uh, that, I think that's quite something right. But do you consider yourself uh, like that, or do you think you 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 you're more into you're getting into an, another direction now, or do you have like um, some precise idea of of the style of music you you're tending to? Uh, uh, we were talking about influences that change, uh, you know, as as uh, as long you get uh, older and as long the years are, are passing. But do you think you you're going to is that like a new thing you're going to, to develop in the next uh, album? As this is volume one, and volume two is going to be even louder or more even melodic. Do, do you have an idea about the direction? Well, it's already done. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. So right. It's, you know, all those songs were written together at one time, and we didn't decide which songs were going to go on which, which record until after it was all recorded. Okay. And so volume two is just basically a continuation of volume one. If you like volume one, you're going to like volume two. It's okay. all, you know, part of the same pie. Um, but as far as, you know, in the future goes, you know, we released that song Wishing with Des singing clean vocals on it. And uh, I didn't know that he was going to do that when I, when I, they sent me the song after we recorded it. And I was really impressed. I really liked it. So you know, as of now, people have been asking me a lot, are you going to do more of that? And I'm absolutely, you know, yeah. it's uh, now that I know that where, you know, Des did some clean vocals in Cold Chamber, but I don't think that style of clean vocals that he did really fits for Devil Driver very well. But I think he's found something very cool now that we can, you know, use and manipulate and do things in a different way in the future as far as clean vocals with him. And you know, I'm definitely on the next record. I'm going to start writing some songs for him to, to embrace that a little bit more. Yeah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it a lot, but um, <laughs> definitely want to throw that in there a little bit. And probably, you know, it's it's the only song that we did on dealing with demons that has clean vocals in it. So there's, you're not going to get any more of it on on the next record. But uh, I yeah, think maybe the, in the future, the maybe a, a slight be. manipulation of it, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah i think so oh okay that's interesting you know that's some maybe that's something you wouldn't expect to to put in in a record maybe five years ago or uh in the 2016 uh past record so that's that's quite interesting and uh, did you for for the guitar geek who are watching and not um surely you know knowing your gear uh, i i just discovered as well that you have the the honor to have you, the, the official signature uh, guitar under your name mm -hmm. so uh which is which is like kind of uh the flying v shaped guitar like i saw like a mahogany body i saw a white one which which was apparently unique from esp that they sent you which is like a mahogany body with a white maple top and fishman mm -hmm. pickups so um that, do, is it something that just Make the mate did just for you, or is that something that uh, or a similar version that people can can find out there? I I saw some in brown finish out there, but uh, there's there's a a signature guitar that ESP sold of mine uh, a few years ago, and it was out for like three or four years through ESP. It's not available anymore. They got rid of it, um, but the white one that I have is an original and. That one, it's just a one-off, another custom that I got. And I was hoping they would turn it into a signature series guitar, but they never did. Mm -hmm. And that is my favorite guitar to play live. Like it's, that is, it's a really, really cool guitar. I mean, every time I take that thing out, you know, my other guitar player, Neil, who doesn't play ESPs, every time he picks that thing up, he just is like, dude, this is one of the best feeling guitars I've ever felt. Yeah, and, you know, I've, amazing on it. Yeah, and... You know, I give it to let other, you know, like we were on tour with Static X, the uh, guitar player, Koichi. He just every single day, yeah. you know, he would just go up to, you know, when, when my guitar tech would take it out of the case, you would just see him with it around the venue almost every day, just playing on it. Not even plugged in, just wanted to, to mess around with it. And, you know, at the, on the last show of the tour, you know, we surprised him and set it up for Static X tuning and let oh, him nice. on a song. and. 
but I, yeah, I get a lot of great feedback on that, that guitar. And it's just, it's basically the same thing as my signature guitar, except two things. It has a maple top on it and there's no, um, paint on the, uh, on the back of the neck. It's just, you know, a, a raw finish. Yeah. And, uh, something about those two factors really made that that guitar come together and it's yeah if i lost that guitar i'd be a very very sad person yeah yeah it's like I, I, of you. yeah it's like take any one of my other guitars they're like easily replaceable but that that white v that i have is yeah i, I i've been actually i've been meaning to write esp to find out if you know who in japan made that for me because i want to write them and be like dude this <laughs> this guitar is phenomenal. But, uh, I don't know if I could find out who did it. It might, might be too long. Was, I've had that guitar for, God, probably almost 10 years now. I, I mean, if ESP is listening to us, they should, I, in my humble opinion, they should do like a signature thing because everybody, I, I, I'm not like an ESP buyer usually, but when I saw that guitar in, in like a rig, you were, you were showing in a show in Chicago or something, and uh, that guitar was like, wow, because it's like a right, slightly, from what I saw on YouTube, it was like a slightly white transparent finish, but on top, mm -hmm. but you can see the maple, um, you know, figure uh, on underneath the paint job. I, that's, that's quite killer. And, uh, and uh, even the strings, I was, I was um, quite amazed to see, I think you were playing like 1062 something yes. like that so yeah. so because usually the the, the higher strings uh, we, we you know we, we see when people are playing a 62 because you guys are playing drop c i think mainly mm -hmm. so uh, so the, the higher string i like maybe 11 or you know not not stronger but but a 1062 is that a custom made uh, string set you you're making for yourself or it people can find yeah out? it's Everything from the first to the fifth string is pretty, is a standard uh, string gauge size. Um, most people would probably put a 56 or a 58 in that, the set that I'm using, but um, I, I admit, I, I, my, my right hand is almost a little too heavy. I mean, it, I think it kind of yields to a cool tone in the long run that works for me, but the problem is the bigger the string you go, the little less bite you get in your guitar tone, you know, because yeah. it starts to sound a little bit more boomy. So if you can get, if, if you're the type of player that can get away with like a 58 or a 60 in, in tuning where you're in like drop C or something like that, I would say it's better to go that route. But for me with my heavy right hand, it's when I'm, you know, when I'm playing power chords, it's when I, when I strum it, it's like, it sounds out of tune for just a split second for me because the strings are, are wobbling so much that they're stretching yeah. and it goes out of tune and it takes, you know, a little, like a microsecond for it to, you know, get into tune with one another. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a thicker string is it's going to be more rigid. It's not going to bend as much. And so when I play, it doesn't sound out of tune, but I'm losing a little bit of this, the best way I could describe it is bite. Like it just a thinner string is going to pierce through the mix a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. But um, that's the best way I could describe it. I mean, if you really want to know what I'm <laughs> talking a about, nice description. You know? you know, go grab a guitar, put it in, you know, in drop <laughs> tuning and see what I'm, what's happening. Yeah, and put like a 65 on it, and you know, and play a riff, and then take it off and put a 58 on. And play the same riff and listen to the both of them. I can almost guarantee you're gonna like the way the 58 sounds better. Okay, yeah, that's that's nice to to hear. You know, I I, I recommend people to try it and think about you when they will. <laughs> but but uh, and do you do you? We were talking because you're talking pre very precisely about what you you're having in mind, uh, guitar tone wise. Uh, so do you do you really? Uh, are, are you a guitar freak in, in the studio or on tour? Do you hear like differences between like pedal or oh, you're a guitar freak? <laughs> I mean, right. yeah, I've got that. I've got, <clears throat> I, mean, I have so many, I got guitars here. I've got all my overdrive pedals. Wow. You know, all that crap. And, you know, and then all this as well. Well, well, yeah, that's um, a decent rig, right? <laughs> this is my sanctuary, yes. But yeah, you know, I've, you know, I, 
I used to pretty much religiously use my Axe effects at home in my studio and on tour. And I pretty much, I, you know, unless I was in like a stadium touring band where I could bring out this massive rig and two yeah. heads and cabinets. Like the or like, Mason or, yeah. yeah, I mean, I would probably take out my Friedman or my Driftwood um, with me on tour. Because, and, you know, those are definitely two of my favorite amplifiers that I have right now. But um the axe effects is just easy but you know when i finally built this studio i was able to put it in an isolation booth so i can set up a, a speaker cabinet and i soundproof the hell out of it so you know i can crank that thing to 11 and wow. my neighbors can't hear a thing mm -hmm. it's you can hear a little bit of low end outside but the crickets outside of my house are literally louder than it so um i started getting back into more analog stuff and i uh after playing the Axe Effects for so many years and then, you know, building this place, hooking up a speaker cabinet and playing through a real head again, my, my eyes just went like this. I was just like, oh, my God, that's what I've been missing. Like, <laughs> I was always one of those people that was like, nah, the Axe Effects and the Kemper. It's like you're not going to notice the difference at all. And you know what? Most people probably don't. But but I do. The people that I you come in here and record you know they hear it as well because they're a lot of them are seasoned guitar players mm -hmm. and you know i just it's nice to have you know and mm -hmm. i don't like using one amp for a whole record anymore you know we mix things up you know it's yeah. even when i did the wednesday 13 record a couple years ago you know like every song you know me and the guitar players would just be like all right you know what amp do you want to use for this song let's try this one no we don't like this one try this one. Oh, okay you know, yeah, that's a guitar player paradise to have the, the choice for like which song, which amp, which guitar. Uh, what are you using like the white V all the time? Or I, I see many guitars behind you. So do that, you all the time that, the guitars? That guitar hardly ever gets used in the studio because I don't like playing V's at home. Okay. The Eclipses behind me, the, the Les Paul style guitars yeah. are, are my favorite to play because they, they sit in my lap nicely when I'm at home. Yeah. And uh and so it's it's always been V's on tour and then eclipses when I'm when I'm at home. Okay. And did you ever try some some uh, talking about Les Paul? Did you ever try what we call like the holy grail of git of you know vintage guitar? Like are, are you are you tending as well to play at home at least you know or in the studio some vintage stuff or are you interested in vintage gear in general? You're you're saying you're tending to analog stuff, uh, so maybe maybe some vintage gear in the in the future maybe um you know i don't have anything that I, I would say the oldest piece of gear that i have uh, well i do have the original line six pod which <laughs> yeah which is, I, I, I never turn i never turn that thing on but it's almost I, a vintage thing now <laughs> yeah i don't consider that vintage that thing is <laughs> It's pretty worthless, actually. I never use it anymore. And did you try some vintage guitars that you said, like, wow, like original Les Pauls or? The yeah, when we, uh, when we used to go and record at this place called Sonic Ranch in Texas, we did Last Kind. No, we so did The Fury of Our Maker's Hand, Last Kind Words, and we did Beast, all at this place. And that the guy that owns the studio has a pretty cool collection of guitars. He's got. He has an old Telecaster that was owned by Stevie Ray Vaughan yeah. that we used on one song. Um, he's got quite a few Les Pauls, and we did use one once that was from the 70s. Okay. And we used that on, we actually used that same Les Paul on uh, Fury and The Last Kind of Words. Okay. Mm. And then um, Gibson came out with this guitar called a Raw Power. Mm -hmm. and they they eventually changed it um i think they might still sell them but it's not the same raw power like the first couple years they made it i mean it was there was no paint on this thing they sold it with emg 81s um mahogany basically you know like my v but in the style of a les paul and um we ended up using that song on our on our album beast Okay. And, uh, but every record since then, I've, I've used my ESPs. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I mean, vintage gear is so ridiculously expensive. Oh, yeah. Now it's, it's crazy out there. Yeah. You know, like I've got, you know, 
compressors and you know and preamps that are uh clones you know i've got an api 312 that i had some guy make me in his garage you know that's an exact replica of an api and you know i got this uh black lion audio 17 compressor that's you know a replica of 1176 you know so i don't really bother with vintage gear that much yeah. and i would like to but it's like i'm not going to pay 10 grand for a compressor you know it's just, of course yeah yeah um and especially for guitars which are even sometimes more expensive you know it's it's yeah. getting higher and higher and maybe you know with the with the the string go gauges that you that you're using the amp you're using maybe that doesn't make you know make sense to to have like a 60 years old vintage les paul like a 59 that's worth like an house to, to put like a 62 you know in the in the in the low e string you know so uh but worth a try, maybe one day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would like to have some vintage. Vintage amps don't interest me at all. I mean, I guess I wouldn't mind having a couple of vintage amps for like clean tones. Yeah. But there's no vintage amps I'm going to use that are going to have high enough gain for me yeah. to be happy with compared, you know, with, you know, the tone that I want to get today. You know, it's just you might be able to find some stuff from the '80s. You know, like the, you know, PB fifty one fifty block letter. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, probably a few Marshalls and, um, but, and there are definitely probably some good Mesa boogies out there, but I want to say most of the amps, like as far back I was go, as far as amps, and if you're going to call them vintage would be in the nineties, which isn't yeah, yeah isn't he's... really all that long ago. I mean, I've got this, you know, dual rectifier, um, the rack mount right here yeah, yeah sure yeah and that's from the 90s that my 5150 is from the 90s yeah so one of the first finally yeah and then i got that marshall jmp1 and i think this preamp right here if you could see it this thing yeah, right yeah. Here, um it's called a pv rock master and it's just a preamp so you got to send it through an amplifier too but we use that on dealing with demons a little bit it's no overdrive pedal in front of it needed it's it has so much gain on it and my our producer steve had never heard one before okay plug that thing in he's like let's try this and he plug it in he was just like holy shit this thing that's is cool <laughs> but, yeah i think i got it for 40 dollars whoa that's not nice. that's one of the nicest deal for the sun you get out of it <laughs> yeah. so if you want a cheap preamp you know, for all you guitar geeks out there, you know, you're going to have to find a, an amp. You could just plug it into the back of any amp head. Just put it back in the return. That's what okay. we do. Oh, that's a but, good advice. Uh, P PV Rockmaster. Like, you can find them really cheap. I had to get mine repaired, and it, co probably, it cost me over $100 to get it repaired and get all the electronics swapped out that had gone bad over the years. But um, they're they're really cool. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, will, I will keep... Uh... We do have like a small thing, like like you like you, like you have in smaller, uh, you know, smaller size uh, in, in the shop in, in Paris. So I, I I keep it in mind. And talking about, I see you have like a fifty one fifty, and uh, uh, since one month I saw your Instagram. You were you were as well uh, a bit. You know, it was a shockful day when Hedy left us. So the, I, I think you, from what I saw on your Instagram, that you uh, were uh, honored to to meet him once. Uh, in Guitar Center Hollywood, uh, I think I saw that the the day. Oh, the Eddie. Yeah, Eddie. Yeah. Yeah, my I got a really good friend named Hunter that uh, is the senior for photographer for Guitar Center. So you know they send him all over the world to to take pictures of artists, and you know they come by. You know mostly it would work out of the Guitar Center Hollywood or the uh, the offices around there, and. You know, he was shooting Eddie Van Halen one day, and I don't remember, I think I had to be up there in Hollywood for something else, so I stopped by, and, um, you know, I got to meet him very briefly. Okay. But, you know, unfortunately, I never got to see him live. Yeah, but, me too, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, and, it is what it is. And, but, and how did you, did, did he have, what do you think about, about uh, you know, I think it was like everybody knew about, of course, how talented Eddie Van Halen uh, was, but oh, did, did he have um, a, an impact on your guitar playing, or were you listening to him in the in the eighties or in the nineties when you were growing up, or not that much? A little bit, 
you know, I, there was a time where I, I remember I bought Van Halen's OU812. Yeah. Um, but I never really got into it. Van Halen was, they just weren't heavy enough for me back in those days. Yeah. But I, but I did enjoy watching Eddie play guitar, but he definitely wasn't an influence on me. I would say, you know, my, my biggest influences would be like, you know, as far as guitar players yeah. would be, uh, um, you know, definitely James and Kirk from Metallica, Dave Mustaine, Dimebag, and uh, Jerry Cantrell. And Bjorn from In Flames, I would say, was, is another big one for me. You know, they uh, these days I appreciate Bjorn and Jerry Cantrell the yeah. most, I think, because they have a way of like they can shred if they want to, but they don't they don't take it too far. You know, they're not trying to play a million miles per hour to impress everybody, which is cool, but they just have a way of phrasing the wrist where it's like they're telling a story and it's you know, it's saying something, you know, through their wrist where it's just, it kind of paints a picture for you mm -hmm. better than I think a lot of other guitar players do. And that's, those are the kind of guitar players that I like the best. Now, Dimebag shredded his ass off, but he did the same thing. And so really Dime was like this anomaly of being able to shred and play a million miles per hour, but still kind of paint this picture for you with his playing that, I just I don't think anyone does as well as, as Dime did mm -hmm. but as far as people that are still alive <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, uh, Jerry and Bjorn are definitely on the top tier for me okay cool so I mean we I think we we have like the full uh, circle of your guitar geek side you know and uh, I'm going to I'm going to to put the album here because I think you know every uh, every you know, non-metal music listener should listen to him because I definitely assume my, my you know, my more classic uh, rock side. And when I listened to, to your, your guy's work, you know, I was like, wow, why, why, didn't, uh, I, why I didn't know this band before, you know? And uh, which is a shame for me because I think you were playing Hellfest in 2017, um, uh, the, the, the year Aerosmith was playing. Mm -hmm. and, I was for the Aerosmith show, and uh, I think you guys were playing maybe two hours before them or three hours before them. And I was like, you know, I just watched the performance today, and I was like, no way, I, I miss it, you know. <laughs> so hopefully, do do you have when the pandemic is going to be over? Do you have? I, I'm sure we you hope to to tour again, you know, all around the world to see your fans because you probably miss them at, as they as they missing you much. Yeah, I, I was actually just on the phone with Des yesterday and we were talking about the possibilities of touring and what we're going to do. And, you know, there, there are tentative plans out there, but as of now, it's like we have plans to do something, but whether we're going to be able to follow through with those plans or not kind of remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. but yeah. We do have plan. We, we do plan on coming back to Europe. We do plan on doing the States. You know, that's going to be, we just did Australia and Japan. So unfortunately, you know, those aren't really on the priority list right now. I would say Europe and the States are. So as soon as things open up again mm -hmm. and we can actually go to concerts. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the States and Europe will, will be a priority for us. Yeah, and to see uh, to see you, you your fans again, and to to finally as well also defend the the, the last album, you know, because yeah. I can't wait to see personally. I don't know if you guys are going to play that song live, but Nest of Vipers. I, if you guys are, are are playing in Paris, I definitely want this song to be played on stage, if possible, because that was my per personally that was my favorite of the of the album. I'm glad you liked it. So, uh, Mike, I, I can't thank you so much to, to, have, um, to give some time for the show. Uh, I wish you a good day there. And, uh, Thanks for having me. And for, oh, you know, it was a real pleasure. And uh, thank, thanks again for, for your time and talking about the studio, the stuff, your inspiration. And uh, I can't wait to see you guys live. Thanks, man. It's good talking to you. Thank you very much. I wish you a good day, man. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.